walk around with a boot, eh? Give him a flower. I remember John Peel playing that on Borough Radio London back in the day. Uh, it very much summed up the mood of Flower Power London. That's, uh, that's amazing summer of 1967. You're listening to Six Music. I'm Tom Robinson. A little earlier on, we played a short clip of uh, Two Virgins, Side One by Yoko Ono. I said it would be mercifully short, and it was... Um, it was 1 minute 48, which isn't really a huge amount when you consider the entire side lasts 14 or 15 minutes. But um, Louise Toll tweeted, hmm, and Louisa Mead tweeted, hmm, not mercifully short enough, hashtag make it stop. Um, Guy from the People's Republic of Harrow says, how fascinating to hear that Peter Jenner managed the clash. I thought it was Bernie Rhodes. Can't wait to hear the interview. You're absolutely right. The Clash's long-time manager was Bernie Rhodes, and he managed them from the beginning, and he managed them at the end. But there was a period when the Clash went away from Bernie, and they sought uh, more... Um, that's a different management, a different kind of management style, and and uh, they went to Peter Jenner, and he managed them, and they went off and they wrote an album, and it was called London Calling. So you have to say that his period of tenure at the helm certainly helped the band. Uh, but we didn't get that far in the interview. To be honest, we only reached 1978-79 or thereabouts um, in, in the course of the conversation that we recorded earlier. And uh, as I say, we're going to have to invite Peter Jenner back the, in the new year to pick up the rest of the story and hear about all those years. Uh, Joe Boyd, we can't go without mentioning Joe Boyd, who... Um, Friend of Six Music, um, managing director of Hannibal Records, producer of Nick Drake, so much else. He produced this. <laughs> The Purple Gang, Granny Takes a Trip, one of the seminal songs of the London Underground with its bizarre barking mad skiffle noise going on there, produced by Joe Boyd. I'm Tom Robinson. My guest tonight is Billy Bragg's long-time manager, Peter Jenner, who dropped by to tell us about how Billy's career was launched with a cut price seven-track album of demos. But first, we're going to hear Billy himself telling Steve Lamack about how he came to meet Peter Jenner in the first place after the BBC News with Jason. 
Six Music. This is BBC Radio. Six Music. Good evening to you and the former Liberal Democrat leader Lord Ashdown has died at the age of 77. He'd been diagnosed with bladder cancer. Paddy Ashdown began his career in the military, serving with the Royal Marines and the Elite Special Boat Service, before entering Parliament in 1983. He went on to lead the Lib Dems for more than a decade. The party's current leader, Sir Vince Cable, said it was a hugely sad day. He had great uh, enthusiasm, energy, optimism, drive. He was very much Mr. Action Man, you know, the style that he acquired in the military, he carried into politics very effectively. Uh, and he did great things for our party. He doubled our number of MPs, uh, I was one of them, and benefited from that. Uh, and he really established us as, as a major force in British politics. Another former Lib Dem leader, Sir Nick Clegg, said that Lord Ashdown was the reason he entered politics, whilst John Major described him as a true patriot whose overriding wish was to serve his country. Police are continuing to search a property in Crawley after two people were arrested in connection with illegal drone flights that crippled nearby Gatwick Airport this week. A 47-year-old man and a 54-year-old woman were arrested last night and they're still being questioned. A special sitting of U.S. senators has ended without an agreement to end a government shutdown in Washington. Nine government departments will now continue with no funding until after Christmas. Democrats had refused to accept President Trump's demand for a budget to include $5 billion to build a wall along the border with Mexico. In football, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's reign as the interim Manchester United manager is off to a winning start. His side thrashed Cardiff City 5-1 in the Premier League's late game. The United winger Ashley Young said the squad responded well to the new coach. He's just jinked and tweaked a few things. You know, he wants us to play the ball quicker forward. I mean, I think it showed that today and you need to... You managed to blag your way into a see Pete Jenner. I knew him, mate. When I worked in a record shop, I knew a bloke who uh, painted rock and roll band backdrops in his attic. And I said to him, you know, I, what I really need is a kind of like a, a sort of political manager. And he said, oh, you need, I know a bloke called Peter Jenner. I'd met him when he managed to clash. So I sought him out and he was working, at, he was working for Charisma Records. He was an A&R man at Charisma Records. So I went down there to sort of try and say, can I come and see you, you yeah. know, so yeah. I'd like to see Peter Jenner. But while I was sitting there, a woman came out and looked at me and she said, are you the bloke who's come to tune the video in? So I just said, yeah, that's me. If I look like the bloke who's come to tune the video, I am the bloke who's come to tune the video. Now, everyone says, oh, you know, this is a black. It wasn't a black. I tuned them for a bloody video in, right? I crawled <laughs> under their telly, <clears throat> and I did what they asked. I tuned it in. I think they wanted to record. It was the first episode of The Tube, and Peter Gabriel, who's a com right. uh, charisma artist, yeah, was on. Yeah, yeah. And so they were all assembled there, all the staff. Right. I crawled under the telly, bish, bash, bish, bash, boop, 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 boop. Up it come. We're all standing there watching it, and I'm standing watching it too, and I said to someone, it's Peter Jenner there. Say, yes, him over there. So thanks, mate. So I went over and popped him a, a cassette. Wow. And uh, then he came to see me at the tunnel. First of all, we went to the wrong tunnel. We went to Rovride Tunnel. Right. <laughs> so we only saw the last song. And he said the atmosphere was so electric in there. He said, Billy, I was really, really impressed. And I asked a woman at the bar what she thought, and she said she thought you were brilliant. So. If he'd have been there 10 minutes earlier, he'd have seen there was a fight, a table went over. And the reason the atmosphere was so electric was because I was trying to hold the thing together and not have a fight break out again, which yeah. sometimes you can do from the stage. Yeah. And the person he asked was my girlfriend. <laughs> so his offer was, she wrote to me and said, we must do something, however trivial. He's always been a bit of a, uh, a mover shaker, but also someone trying to do something different. He really, really hates the music industry. It all sounds so simple, doesn't it, Steve? It all sounds like it all just falls into place. But what's, what you can't see from where we are sitting now is the six months between me recording Life's a Right with Spy vs. Spy in February of 1983 and it coming out in the July. And so when it did happen, Jenna physically gave me a box of 25 Billy Bragg albums, Life's a Right with Spy vs. Spy. 
and said, see if you can get some radio play. <laughs> I was like, I thought you were supposed to do that. So get out. That's Billy Bragg talking to Steve Lamack last month about meeting our guest tonight, Peter Jenner. Peter, does that sound like a familiar story? I'm afraid it's all too familiar. I pass in the park in a splendid manner. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the young Billy Bragg like when you first clapped eyes or clapped ears on him? He was always sort of charming and I also I suppose also come from a sort of stolidly middle class background um, sort of like the fact that he was working class there was a certain element of that he seemed like a nice bloke and he got in and why not talk to him you know he found me and we talked and he gave me a cassette and then I took that cassette with me and, and it's it's very strange that I remember listening to the cassette whilst doing my gardening in the country so I took my cassette player with me and, and I played his demo and there was one track which particularly got me and it was because of the line it was the busy girl buys beauty the busy girl buys beauty the pretty girl buys style I thought that's a really smart observation and in a sense that's what got me hooked on checking him out more and so on you know. and so you did go down to the tunnel and uh, saw the last song I went to see him live and of course being me I arrived late hence you know as Bill has explained all the thing that went down I never saw him live there but I did see him subsequently I first got to meet you as Billy Bragg's manager in the early 80s and I remember the extraordinary thing about his arrival on the scene was he was unlike any artist who was out there making their name in music because he was playing solo with one electric guitar and with a kind of Dylan-esque attitude to melody and the songs were extraordinary but the recording was very very cheap yes was that deliberate at the time no we didn't have a record company so <laughs> you know, they had to be cheap in fact the first album was all actually a series of demos for chapel music we were, it was done in chapel music demo studios because you know charisma was going down the tubes and so there was no money to go into a proper studio or anything so we had jeff chegwin who was working at chapel music who was the publisher and he was very helpful uh, and he was the only real link I had because Charisma was going down the tube, so they had no money. I had no money. I mean, I really should have told Billy not to bother with me, you know, if I'd been more sensible. But, you know, I like the song. I like The Busy Girl by Beauty and listen to some of the other songs. And I like what I heard. And then I remember that the philosophy you explained to me was that if the record costs nothing to make, then every single copy sold is profit. And that on that basis, he sold 160,000 copies of that first album. Because it was a billion and there were short songs, we were able to put it out as an album. So we were able to treat it as an album, even though it was, I don't know, seven tracks or eight tracks or something. Really, it was a single. Really, it could have been put onto an EP or what, something. But no, we put it out as an album. And then we put it out very cheap. And that was part of the initial marketing thing, which... which I think I started really and then so the idea with the record was conceived by me and delivered by Barney Bubbles which was and it seemed to me that because of the age I'm at I could relate to Penguin Books it was a conscious rip-off of Penguin Books because I felt that if we had made it look like a Penguin book it would as it were be a subconscious message to people uh, that if you were sort of young and groovy you might be interested in this record if you were literate because it seemed to me we weren't playing a, it wasn't a dance record it wasn't a pop record it needed to have people who were going to listen to it if you didn't listen to the lyrics it wasn't a great musical experience <laughs> and of course Billy played everywhere at that time I and mean, he had a busking rig with a speaker on his back in a harness uh, well now that was just a gimmick we did a few times but, <laughs> I mean that was a gimmick we were aware of the value of gimmicks um, and that we actually did when we went to America for the first time we took it and, and he had batteries in, in there to power the thing and it was a, a, a music conference and we thought well we better go and try and make a bit of a get noticed there very strange but it had the effect of being noticed. It was also a rip-off. I was ripping off, uh, as all the best things were rip-offs, so I ripped off um, the thing that Elvis Costello did for Jake Riviera. He had him playing acoustic guitar outside one of the big hotels in Park Lane. And it was a big 
international conference for for the, the label I think it was Sony it wasn't Sony then it was CBS and so they would notice him and I realized that was the thing so if you go into this conference with this sort of weird do-it-yourself and play electric guitar in a conference cause the last thing they want to see in conferences is music yeah you know so that was a thing go and get him with music and he was very noticeable and it certainly was what helped kick off his career in America and his career in Britain was kicked off by the fact that he played benefits, he played in record shops, he played anywhere that would have him, whether it was paid or not, he'd sleep on people's floors. Well, I think it was actual sort of policy that Billy would play anywhere that would play his fares, give him somewhere to sleep and a meal. And that was the deal. I knew we weren't going to get on radio, so that we had to, if we were going to develop his career, sell any records, get anywhere, we had to do it by being live. And so the idea was you'd play with anyone, at anywhere, providing they'd pay his fares. And he would carry his guitar and his amp and whatever else he needed with him, and he'd go by train. Do you recognise Billy's description of you in that little clip that we heard as he's always been a bit of a mover-shaker, but someone trying to do something different, and he really, really hates the record industry? Yes. I think, actually, it's more fundamental, almost. I mean, in a sense, I was brought up on a very left-wing background, so that... It was corporates. It was the idea of, of big companies and corporates, you know. And although we'd done stuff with the uh, Floyd, with the EMI, um, overall, I always carried a sort of a suspicion of corporates. Let's go back to those early days then. You were born in 1943. Yes. Your dad was a vicar. So what was it like growing up in a vicarage? My father was a vicar in Southall. And just down the road from Southall is Hayes, which was the EMI factory. And so my father had a connection in with some of his parishioners to getting cheap records from EMI. So I was always, I really loved music and listened to a lot of records because my father could get them in for cheap, you know. It was classical music and, and show music and, and things like that. But then personally I became very involved with listening to jazz music with my brother. My brother and I, and we spent all our money buying records from Dobell's record store in Charing Cross Road, which was fantastic. They opened lots of doors for me. You know, you, I'd go in and say, you know, that was great, the one you sold me, but what's next, you know? And, and that's how I got into sort of people like John Coltrane and so on. As a kid, I'd gone with my brother and myself. We went and saw people like uh, Cam Basie and Duke Ellington when they first started touring in the, in, in the UK because before then they weren't able to tour. There was lots of problems with Americans coming in to work in the UK. And I remember to this day sort of putting a programme through the window to the Duke Ellington band room I found in, in Kilburn. They signed it for me. The band signed it and they sent it back to me and, and I've lost it. I don't know where it's gone. But, oh no! Oh, I know. Don't don't. It's, it's sort of it's tragic. So thinking back to the lost program, Peter, what tune should we play from Duke Ellington? You can't do better, really, than take the A train. Thank you. 
Now, 1966, 1967, those two years in London seem to have been kind of like a cultural big bang. You know how astronomers find bits of the universe expanding in an outward direction <clears throat> and can work out from that that there must have been a central point where suddenly everything went mayhem, berserk, and a huge cultural explosion seems to have taken place around 66, 67 in London. And we've seen individuals like John Peel who gravitated out from that. Uh, we've even got people like Richard Thompson or Joe Boyd who yeah. are still out there doing things but still being thrust outwards from that huge explosion. And one of the largest asteroids to come from that, in my view, is yourself. Because you were right in there at the founding of the Commune in Notting Hill Gate, the founding of the Notting Hill Carnival, the London Free School, the UFO Club, and the kind of epicentre of where all this stuff was going. How did you get drawn into that? Well, one of the secrets uh, about the whole thing, it was all revolved around John Hopkins, Hoppy, and he had a flat in Queensway where we held meetings for the London Free School. It sort of coalesced around Hoppy in a way. They were, we were all mates of Hoppy in one way or another. It was very interesting in, in hindsight that, that we were probably all, nearly all of us were graduates from Oxford and Cambridge and had all gone through the sort of the 40s, 50s, free education, you know, with grants, you know, and all the sort of the wondrous things that happened in, in that period. And uh, we met there and we were talking about the sort of the future of the world. We were all sort of, you know, straight out of university with a desire to create a better world. I mean, it was very naive, but very admirably naive. And because we were based in that area, and our meeting place was in Hoppers Place in Queensway. We b were very, became very aware that we were very privileged compared with the people around us, because at that time, Notting Hill was a slum with rackmen and slum landlords, and it was uh, very tied up with immigration from West Indian immigration into London. And that also brought in the dope culture, which again was a very important aspect of it. The marijuana culture, which which also a lot of that came from Jamaica directly or indirectly, you know. And uh, Hoppy too was uh, was always involved. He, his was comes from North Africa, from Morocco. He somehow had a connection and it was very cheap. You get <laughs> for four pounds, you get an ounce of marijuana. Really nice, nice fresh stuff straight from Morocco. That said, Peter, the BBC's line is Kids just don't do it, you know. We're, we're, we're not endorsing the use oh. of recreational drugs in any way from the BBC. No, no, the BBC isn't, but I am. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your inalienable yeah, I, prerogative. Exactly. <laughs> On the subject of taking drugs, we have to play a piece of music at this point. And what better piece of music than Astronomy Domine from Pink Floyd? Coming up. After this, six music. Ba, 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 ba. Merry Christmas. Iggy Pop on Christmas Day. Here, however, is something completely different. Turn my white Christmas blue. Christmas tunes of every kind, something a little more alt. The music's got to sound a little dirtier, too, to please me. Followed by something very special with the beautiful and sensational medieval babes live in the studio to sing anything they want. You need a surprise sometimes. This is Iggy Pop. Join me on my Christmas Day show. This Tuesday afternoon from 1 on BBC Radio 6. Six music. This is the Tom Robinson Show. BBC Radio 6 Music.
Astronomy Domine from the early Pink Floyd from Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Peter Jenner, you chose that one for us. It was all about the times of sort of uh, moon flights and things like that. So space was a, a, an important issue generally, and Sid was certainly Sid Barrett was certainly very involved with sort of the ideas of space. And the lyrics of Astronomy Domini come from his reading of a, of a sort of a basic encyclopedia about space, you know. And it got me to do an intro to the track, and it's all just about space. Can you describe the time you first clapped ears on Pink Floyd? When was the moment where, in a pre-Pink Floyd world, you suddenly were exposed to them? It comes from the London Free School. But one of the people at the London Free School would put on a show at the, the Old Marquee, which at that stage was in Oxford Street, and it was a freak-out or something like that. And so it was on a Sunday night. That's why you could get the Marquee Club, because a Sunday night they were available. So I was marking exams from the LSE, and I had a huge pile of exams, and I'd gone piling through them, but I hadn't got to the end, and I thought, I can't stand reading any more of these. So I decided that I'd go to this freakout. It was a, a, a psychedelic experience, and the band was on a stage which sort of projected into the audience, and, and I remember walking around it, it's really vivid, walking around the stage, trying to work out where the noise was coming from because they started by playing a sort of regular old blues and instead of having a, a guitar solo you know diddly 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 guitar solo which was the sort of the format if you're lucky it was eric clapton but more often it wasn't and i couldn't work out where the noise was coming from where is i could hear the bass i could hear the drums I could see that someone was singing. You couldn't actually hear vocals in those days, but you could see that there was someone singing, and, and that's what got me interested, because also the way they were improvising, there was this sort of very free-form improvisation, so they weren't just going through the chords. That I liked, and it, I was very involved with being avant-garde, because the London Free School, we were going to have a label with avant-garde music, it was going to have avant-garde classical music, whatever that was, avant-garde pop music. And that was very important, because avant-garde pop music was then, at that time, was just breaking internationally. So the idea was to break the mould of what had gone before, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, and break into something that hadn't been seen before. That's I think that was my perception of it. Whether that was their perception of it is another matter altogether. But to me, it was avant-garde pop music because there was a sort of tune at the beginning and then there was this improvised avant-garde music. So it was avant-garde pop music, you know. We never got round to the avant-garde classical music or the avant-garde, which is the best thing. We were going to have avant-garde folk music music and I really don't know what that was but that would have been interesting and we put out one record and that was the AMM record which was called Extracts from a Continuous Performance which was just improvised noise really of which went on for over two sides of an album it didn't sell very well it's curious that you can't find it on Spotify now really it's still unavailable. <laughs> I, I don't know if you could find that. I bet it's worth a fortune if you could get an original copy of that. So, to cut to the chase here... Cut to the chase. You start pursuing Pink Floyd, trying to get them to uh, get involved on a business level with yourself. To get them to join our label, which was not really existent. <laughs> so it was a bit of an uphill task, you know. So... I went off and, um, and found out from Bernard Stolman, who, who put on the show, I said, who is that band? You know, where are they from? And so I got their address, went to see them, and it was, I said I'd been marking exams, and so it was the summer, and I went over to their house and knocked on the door, and they said, I wonder if you'd like to come on my label with your band, and because they're all in one house, and I was told, no, 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 it's holidays, we're going off on holiday now. So they were no interest in, in someone coming to, to sign them or whatever. No, 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 we're going on holiday. There's a sensible priorities. So I came back after the, the after summer holidays and had the conversation again. And I, I'm sure it must have been Roger who said, no, it's, we don't need a label. What we need is a manager. So I went to see my best friend and old friend Andrew King and uh, said, look, there's this band that want a manager. And... As far as I know, all a manager needs is some money, and I don't have any money. And I believe, Andrew, your aunt has just died and left you a bit of money, so we've got a bit, we could, maybe we can go into business. 
<laughs> so there was a little bit of money. So we, we went to the floor and said, oh, OK, we'd like to manage you. And, and what does the manager do? Well, obviously, manager, what manager does back then is you buy some equipment for the band. Because it's extraordinary to remember how expensive equipment was in terms of how much money you earned. You know, £10 a week was a, a good wage, you know, and, and, and an amplifier would cost £100 or something, you know, at least. So it's, it was big money. So we bought them some equipment and we put them in a van and that night it was stolen. <laughs> Welcome to the music business. <laughs> That's a baptism by fire. A baptism by fire, but it didn't put me off because I'm a foolish old fella. Well, a young fellow then, but still a foolish fella. So within two years, 1968, you and Andrew King had parted company with Pink Floyd because they'd kicked out Sid Barrett, who I believe you and Andrew actually saw as the kind of mainspring of the talent in the band. Well, I mean, he was uh, from the early Floyd. I mean, he wrote the songs, he was the lead guitar player and he was the lead singer. So, I mean, he was the heart. It's very hard to imagine how you could build a, a band around the bass player, drummer and a keyboard player. What was memorable was that combination of Sid and Rick with their sort of how they sort of work together musically. So where was the noise coming from in the end? When you it actually... was coming from both Rick and Sid were playing with Bins and Echorex, which were sort of echo machines. They were solid state echo machines. And, and so there was this, all, a lot of it was just down to sort of, you know, sustain things and they would sort of be moving things. And that was the way you could get away with playing 10 minute songs, just having moody variations. So it was very improvisational. And I mean, I'd come from a jazz background, so that, that made sense, you know, an improvisation, that's what good music is, is improvised. So I like that and that's what sort of turned us on. And then in a sense, that led to all the other things which came with it because I think also because of that gig I saw, the idea of having lights with the band and also there was the influence coming over both at UFO, which was a, the club which the London Free School had did a few shows with, which then became the, the venue. Somehow or another, Hoppy had got some, I think they were probably American draft escapees who'd brought over some lighting things and ideas and uh, approach from the film on, um, from the West Coast. Now, uh, what listeners will not know from that time is how radical the Floyd were in terms of their stage presentation because all the bands up to then had had a spotlight on the artist so you could see the expressions of the mm, mm, of the vocalists mm, mm, and you mm. could see the guitarists throwing shapes the, the Floyd performed in semi-darkness with all this projection going on around yep. them so there was a visual feast yeah well the idea was that we had which was we put in our propaganda was that it was a, a psychedelic experience it was an expanding your your consciousness by an audio visual experience so that that the improvisational aspect of the music would go with visuals which went with it so we always had to have a, a sheet behind the band and then also Andrew and I had built these lights for them which were fixed spots so they had to be very close to the band to have any impact at all. And as a result of that, you got these shadows. So we had a white screen with just sheeting that we fireproofed and then the lights close by. And so you've got these very big shadows behind them of the band. And that was, as it were, the beginning of it. And then from the, uh, the, the Americans, we got the blippy lights, you know, the oil lights, which sort of went bloop, 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 you know, the, 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 the lava uh, lamps. Lava, which are now, of course, lava lamps, exactly the same <laughs> principle, but they were in little slides that were projected from domestic slides. Peter, your projected. story is so extraordinary and there's so much detail to pack in. We're going to have to move smartly along, but you and Floyd only lasted, what, two albums together? Yeah, we did the first album, and also in that context, we did. Uh, games for May, which was as it were the first pop concert in the, uh, the South Bank, um, and EMI, who we we'd, by then we'd signed up with EMI, and EMI had this had brought in all their studio equipment, so we had a sound surround. 
I remember that Nick had a saw that was amplified. So there was an amplified thing. He was sawing a piece of wood on stage and it was amplified and all around. I mean, it was seriously experimental stuff. And they gave away daffodils. It was Games for May. It was a spring thing. So the daffodils were being thrown all over the place. And we got complaints from the South Bank because people had trodden on the daffodils and stained the floors and the seats and things. Shocking. So by 1968, the, that whole initial surge of 66, 67 has kind of consolidated into a movement that started moving outwards. And you and your business partner start putting on free concerts in Hyde Park. These days, people pay, don't they, to go and, go and see a concert in Hyde Park? Yes, but you've got, again, it's this, this thing about America, you know, that there was this sort of relationship with America, which was, I mean, I had gone to America in those early days, but more importantly, there was a sort of across the Atlantic sort of communication, so sort of rather simple, you know, but there'd be a, a, a report in the Melody Maker. And one of the things I saw in a report in the Melody Maker was that they had free concerts in the park, in the Golden Gate Park. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do a free concert. Before that, I'd walked across Hyde Park with my wife, Sumi, and we'd seen there was a bandstand with a few deck chairs around it. And, and I realized, oh, they have concerts here. And so maybe we could do a decent concert. Maybe we could be like San Francisco and have a concert in the park. The park's people were fantastic. I mean, they found a, a, a place for us to go, which was that cockpit by the Serpentines. We had a sort of a little hill so you could see. And then at the bottom of the hill, they put, with, with also there was a road to it so you could access it, they put in some... We have some staging for you. The staging was a staging which they had for people to do Scottish dancing. So it was, it was about six inches high and just laid <laughs> on the ground. You know, and that was our first stage for the first concert in the pub. And it was fantastic. It was really easy and everybody enjoyed it. So I'm sure there was quite a lot of trepidation. Oh my God, what's going to happen? It's a pop group. But there was never any trouble. So that first one we put on, there was no trouble. And then they let us do more after that and, and so on. That first one in 1968 had a lineup of Pink Floyd, Roy Harper, Jethro Tull, and this lot Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs>
One of the great classic lines of rock and roll, I think it's fair to say, Oh, Deborah, you look like a zebra. <laughs> I remember John Peel playing that. That's where I first heard that. Yes. Know, in the middle of the night on the John Peel show. Yes. And... Peel always gave out that he was a close mate of Mark. Mark used to come round to to his house, and uh, you know they they hung out together. And he was such a staunch supporter. He used to put on gigs with him. He'd DJ. Oh, it, it was worse than that from his point of view. I mean, he he would get booked as the Radio One DJ. John Peel doing a show and he would turn up with Mark Bolan and, and there you were hoping to hear the hits and <laughs> you've got Mark Bolan and uh, Peregrine Took who was Tyrannosaurus Rex, so it's just two of them and normally stages were low you know, we were doing it in, in places like the Marquee where stages would be, I don't know, maybe a foot high at the most and I remember there was one show that we did with, with Peel and, and Mark was on it and you know, people were standing up to see the show Mark was sitting down. He wasn't very tall in the best of time, but he was sitting down, and the drummer was playing hand drums, so he was sitting down, they were sitting down, so they were invisible, you know, for the people. You couldn't see them. But, I mean, Peel was amazing. He took them around for a long time, and he played. He paid them out of his money. And um, subsequently, Mark didn't look after Peel when he, he became a big wheeze, and Peel really was very hurt by that because he'd brought him through. He would never have had a hit. He never would have been famous without John Peel's assistant. John Peel carried the, the flag for him. And, and we were mates, so I, I, I was involved as sort of managing T-Rex as a result. So reading about the free concerts in The Melody Maker, were you not inspired to go over and see for yourself what was happening on the West Coast? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to go to America. I mean, I went to America. My father sent me to America to when after I'd finished at school before I went to university he sent me to America he my father was such a wheeler dealer somehow or another his parish in Islington he, he was um, had some connection with a benefactor in America who was a guy who owned a, um, a distillery in Pekin Illinois so he arranged for me and Andrew and then also uh, my friend Jonathan we went to stay in Pekin Illinois in between school and going to university so from Pekin Illinois I was able to get on the on the Rock Island line to go to Chicago for the weekends we'd go on the Rock Island line I mean and that was exciting you know in itself because that was Lonnie Donovan Rock Island line you know that era you know to go on the Rock Island line up to Chicago and then to see these bands I'll tell you where I'm going boy down the Rock Island when I think about it, it's extraordinary. We went to the Sutherland Lounge, which was the big black venue, and we were staying in Hyde Park, which was by the university with people. And we walked all the way across the south side in the middle of the night, you know, these three English teenagers, you know. Uh, I mean, this is meant to be the most dangerous place, but we never had any trouble. I mean, it was a delightful place, but that was really educational. The 68 concert in Hyde Park was succeeded the year later by something altogether bigger scale, the Stones. The first one, which was big, was the Blind Faith one. And that's what was really important, because Stigwood came in on that and thought, right, I've got this new band, Blind Faith, which was Eric Clapton and um, Steve, Winwood. Steve Winwood. And um, he wanted to launch the band and therefore their album. And he thought, oh, I'll do it at a Hyde Park concert. So we thought, oh, well, that's great. So he came to us and we did it. And that was enormously successful and had a huge audience.
That's In the Presence of the Lord by Blind Faith. Steve Winwood, Eric Clapton, Rick Gretsch and Ginger Baker. And that's what turned the, the Stones on to it. The Stones saw what could be done. Now, in that point of time, the Stones had come off the road and had stopped doing gigs. And I think they realised that they need to go back and rebuild their career as a live band. So they saw, I don't know whether it was their management people or whether it was Mick, and, but they, they realised that this was a way to get back. Because live music was coming back, and that's where the, the Brian Jones thing was such a catastrophe. Uh, just again to remind listeners, Brian Jones had died just before that concert was scheduled. The week before. OK, now listen. Now, will you just cool it just for a minute? Because I really would like to say something for Brian. I just to say something that was written by Shelley, and I think it goes with what happened to Brian. Peace. Peace. He is not dead. He does not sleep. He has awakened from the dreams of life. It's we that are lost in stormy visions and keep with phantoms an unprofitable strife. And in a mad trance, we strike with a spirit's knife, invulnerable nothing. We decay like corpses in the charnel. Fear and grief, con grief convulse us and consume us day by day. And cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. The one remains, the many change and pass. Heaven's light forever shines. Earth's shadows fly. Life, like a dome of many-coloured glass, stains the white radiance of eternity until death tramples it to fragments. Die. And if thou wouldst be with that which thou dost seek, follow where all is fled. You cannot imagine how much press that generated. <laughs> that is one of the reasons why it was such a huge gig, was because I remember now that every day of the week before the Stones in Hyde Park, the lead story in the Evening Standard, which was the London paper, was about the, the Stones. So it was the event of the week, and that's why it had such a huge turnout. And it was a free concert. And it was free, and the weather was great. So how did that work economically? I mean, who paid the Stones? No one paid the Stones. The Stones played for nothing. I suppose Granada, who, who filmed it, may have paid some... They certainly paid some of the expenses, and they may have paid a fee to the Stones, or they may not have done. The Stones maybe have just done it to the promo. We did it just for the promo. And our only promotion that we had for our company was Black Hill Enterprises. We had a, a banner across the top of the stage that said Black Hill Enterprises. It was then filmed by Granada. When they zoomed into the stage, all you could see of Black Hill Enterprises was Akil Enterp. <laughs> and that's all we ever got on telly. We didn't have any ownership of the, the film or any kickback or nothing. We got nothing. We were such mugs. But it was great. So did you in 67, make it to see the kind of Haight-Ashbury whole West Coast thing that was happening at the same time as the London scene? Well, what happened was that uh, Joe, who was all part of the London Free School, Joe Boyd, he said, oh, you know, you should go to Electra, then you go to America. So I somehow, I don't know how I got the fares to get to America, but anyway, I got to America and I went to see Electra Records and I just walked in the door more or less and said, oh, Joe Boyd said I should come and see you because Joe was the Electra man in the UK and um, there'd been some questions to whether they would sign the Floyd and, and then, you know, Holtzman didn't more fool him. But they were really nice to me and I had access to their stock cupboard, which was just for someone coming from the 50s in the UK, it was amazing to be able to go into a stock cupboard. All these American records, oh my God, there's a stock cover. I could go and get records. Because it's hard to imagine, but in the 50s, you know, there was, it was, records were very expensive and imports from America. There were lots of governmental restrictions because of exchange controls and all this sort of thing. Joe Boyd gave me an introduction to go and see a lecture. And a lecture then, Paul Rothschild, who was the head of A&R of at, at Electra, which was a small label then, he was lovely and he, he liked this strange young guy from England. And he said, 
you should go to the West Coast. I said, well, I can't afford it. He said, I'll send you. And he sent me to the West Coast, Paul Westcote, at the company's expense, at his expense, I thought, but probably at lecturer's expense, and took me over to the West Coast. And then I hung out a bit with him, and I ended up going to a door session. Don't ask me what, what they played or what the, what the song was or anything, but it was being in a studio. I mean, I've been in the studio in England, but to go to an American studio and see something, you know, it was great. Fantastic experience. An introduction to America. Strange days indeed, that's the doors. So Peter Jenner, we've got you away to the West Coast to see the doors recording a session, but let's drag you back to the free concerts in Hyde Park. There was one artist in common between the 1968 concert in the park and then that much bigger one with the Stones in 69, and that was Roy Harper, who's on the, on the bill for both of them. Was that something to do with you, Peter Jenner? Oh, well, absolutely, because it was the one thing that we got from, really, the, the, the main benefit we got from putting the big shows on in Hyde Park was that we got our bands, because we had an agency, onto the support spot. So, you know, we nearly always opened with the third ear band. So people like Roy Harper, who I was beginning to work with, uh, got a spot. In a way, that was our benefit that we got from putting on the concerts because we didn't get paid. You know, people, it was a free concert. The parks provided all the facilities. And WEM, the audio people who did the PA, they provided it because it was good promo. Everybody was in there getting good promo. So once again, you know, you talk about how expensive the amps were. People don't remember how high a proportion of the average weekly wage the cost of an amplifier was. And by the same token, PA systems 
until this period in time were unknown. Those outdoor concerts weren't even possible in 65 or 64 because the, the equipment wasn't there to get the vocals up over the sound of the band. Well, I mean, it, it was very hard. I mean, when you went to a gig in those days, you didn't expect really to... You went to see the band. <laughs> rather than to hear them, you know. And the bigger the band, the shorter the set. So, you know, you'd play your hits and then you'd zoom off. And at the weekend, most of your shows were at the weekend. So if you were lucky at the weekend, you'd get a double header or a triple header, which was two or three gigs in the night on a Saturday, a Friday night, a Saturday night. And that's how, you know, you made good money that way because they were playing in um, ballrooms and things like that, quite big venues, you know, and people would come out on a Saturday night to see their top 10 acts, you know. And so actually the audio quality in those early days of what you heard was very, very poor. So that's where Wem came in for the Floyd because the noise was important and the power was important part of the, this thing, their sound. We had the Wem wall of sound. And, and Wem stood for Watkins Electric, Electric Music. Music. Yes, Watkins Electric Music. And, and Mr. Watkins was lovely and he was incredibly supportive. He helped the Floyd with their PAs and then he, he built the PAs for the Hyde Park concerts. Charles Charlie Watkins and his brother Reg, I believe. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Charlie Watkins. I remember Charlie, yes. So let's talk about Roy Harper because uh, you are on record as saying Harper is a terrific songwriter, but a bit crazy. What did you mean? It's that whole thing about the, the sort of the link between insanity and genius, you know, which I think in a way Harper is your classic case. He always had breathing problems, so that there was a certain amount of health issues in there and um, he was a singer-songwriter he was had been hanging around in the early before the underground days with the sort of folkies you know when in the sort of early 60s the English folky scene where it included people like Paul Simon and Bob Dylan who were hanging around in, in England and with Martin Carthy and all those folky people and they were all very important uh, and, and interesting they also a lot of them were quite druggy so in a sense it provided a sort of a link into the hippie drugginess I mean so in a way that folk scene was a very important link into the music scene. So you had the R&B scene, which was Zoot Money and people like that, and then you had the folky scene, and somehow in the hippie thing, those things got mixed up. And um, I think that's what made the music so interesting. And Harper was definitely of the folky scene, um, but he was also very interested in rock and roll, in a sense. I was asked to produce Harper's album by his then manager. So I then ended up being his manager. I thought, well, I'd do all the stuff in the studio. I might as well be his manager. I, you know, I don't want to have his manager ruining what we do in the studio. So I had this connection with EMI because of the Floyd had been very successful. We'd had the, the EMI let us have our own label called Harvest Records. That was yours? You... Well, no, it was theirs. We did all the work. They took all the money. <laughs> but Harvest Records was started for Black Hill. Oh, yes, absolutely. So if you look at the early records of people like uh, Edgar Broughton Band and the Third Ear Band, the Pretty Things and things like that. So let's hear a track from Roy Harper. Uh, you've chosen Another Day. Why this one? Oh, I just think it's a lovely song. He still plays it live, and it's a beautiful song, and it's just, uh, just a classic love song. From the 1970 album Flat Baroque and Berserk on Harvest Records, Roy Harper with Another Day. And we'll hear it after this. Six music. Six, 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 six music. Now as the nights creep into the afternoons, it can be a time of reflection. Star of Peaky Blinders. 28 days later, an inception. We often think about how time just flew by. But as a music lover, I wanted to revisit the past year through the tunes it's offered us. And because it's the season, I'd like to share them with you. Killian Murphy. I'm going to be looking back on some of the music that I fell in love with in 2018. And I'll be playing some of my favourite Irish musicians, both old and new. Music can bypass the intellect and go straight to the heart. It's a kind of adventure, isn't it? One artist leads to another artist. This is Killian Murphy. This Sunday afternoon from 1 on BBC Radio 6 Music. The Tom Robinson Show. This is 6 Music. The kettle's on The sun has gone Another day She offers me Tibetan tea 
on a flower tray She's at the door she wants to score She daily needs to say I loved you a long time ago, you know Where the winds on forget me not blow But I just couldn't let myself go Not knowing what on earth there was to know But I wish that I had cause I'm feeling so sad That I never had one of your children Then across the room inside a tomb Her chances waxed and wanes The night is young, why are we so hungry? In each other's jeans I must take her And I must make her While the dove domains And feel the juice run as she flies Run my wings under her sides As the flames of eternity rise To lick us with the firstborn lash of dawn Oh really my dear, I can't see what we fear Sat here with ourselves in between us And at the door We can't say more than just another day And without a sound, I turn around And I walk away From the 1970 album Flat Baroque and Berserk on Harvest Records, produced by my guest tonight, Peter Jenner. That's Roy Harper with Another Day. Um, Earlier on, Peter, you skipped through, kind of in passing, mentioned the Edgar Broughton band, but they were pretty big for Black Hill too, weren't they? Oh, yes, and and they were very big for me. I mean, I did a lot of touring with them in Europe and in the UK, and, um, I mean, I really liked them. They were sort of... um, proto-punk band they were lo- a, a punk band with long hair and their attitude was very punk but on the other hand they came from the hippie era and they were very working class they came from the midlands they traveled in a van with their equipment driven by their mum and dad fantastic and they were just the most lovely people they were such a family there was edgar and his brother steve who was the drummer and then uh, arthur who was the bass player they were loved i think by people because they had such a such spirit and out demons out was the key thing you know was somehow was a sort of political thing and everybody would sing out demons out you know and all sing along with edgar let's hear something from the edgar broughton band this is apache dropout <laughs> Dropout by the Edgar Broughton Band, picked by my guest tonight, Peter Jenner. Peter, I had hoped that in the course of one programme we could encapsulate your extraordinary career, but uh, we've only got ourselves into the (laughs) mid-70s at the latest and we're running rapidly out of time. But before we allow you to go, 
How about we get you back in early January to continue the story in a part two of this interview? But for now, let's just get up to the arrival of Punk itself and Ian Dury and the Blockheads. Well, Black Hill at that time, which was Andrew and my company, we had a basement there, and in the basement there was Jake Riviera and Dave Robinson started working. Dave Robinson, he was recording live at the Hope and Anchor, so he said, look, I need some money from a publishing deal for Ian Jury. I said, who's Ian Jury? He said, Kilburn and the High Roads. Kilburn and the High Roads? I hadn't heard their mind. So anyway, he got me down, and Andrew and I, and we went down to see Ian Jury at the Hope and Anchor. And it was riveting. Ian Jury was always about Ian Jury. I mean, he was a riveting performer. You just couldn't take your eyes off him. So we then decided to become his publisher, as Dave had suggested, but then also we thought, well, if we're putting the money in, we, we ought to become the manager as well. So we became Ian Jury's managers as well as his publishers. And um, from that, we had Ian and the Kilberts, because we been in Kilbert and the High Roads, so we then had Ian and the Kilberts, and then we worked through various things, and it ended up with Ian Jury and the Blockheads, and that was a great experience for, I think, both of us and, and for all the people involved. That was my first real encounter with having a, a serious hit artist who was under my tutelage. And um, Ian was a fascinating guy, an intriguing guy, an annoying guy, an irritating guy, a maddening guy. He was a great person. So you're managing and publishing Ian Dury, but is the record label still Stiff Records with Jack Riviera and Dave Robinson? They were starting down in the basement. Dave had the studio at Hope and Anchor, and that's how we got to see Ian. But Jake and Dave were very involved with Elvis Costello. And so they were, Stiff Records were starting. We were a bit suspicious, you know, these guys, they're just our tenants. But somehow or another, it became clear that that was a good place to go because of Elvis taking off, you know, you could see that, and Barney Bubbles' artwork and things were all happening down in the basement as well. That There was a sort of feel for the label. And... Um, Ian knew, knew them and so on, and it, it led into uh, us becoming involved with Ian's recordings as well. We were doing demos and things, and Ian was looking, and it became clear in the end that what he was looking for was a rhythm section, and that was the key, and an MD. So he found Chaz Janko, who was the piano player and guitar player, who was the musical side, and they wrote some songs together, and then they found, through the demo studio they were working and they found Charlie and Norman so that was the band and if you're looking for a hit making band Chaz Jankel Norman Watroy and Charlie Charles and then Ian Dury fronting it you can't go far wrong well in hindsight you can say that but at the time you know we were being asked to sell a cripple as he styled himself as he styled himself as a cripple and then Ian brought in uh, David Payne, who was the saxophone player who played in uh, Kilburn and the High Roads. That was Ian Jury and the Blockheads. So let's get to New Boots and Panties, which was, in retrospect, a landmark album for them and for the whole era. How involved were you in the recording of that? Well, I, I was the, quotes producer. I mean, it was more than that. We somehow had EMI had sent us too much money. We had some money. We, uh, we let me, let me stop you there. EMI sent you too much money. Yes, yes. They sent us too much money. They sent us money they shouldn't have sent. So we said, oh, well, fine, we keep that. If they give us the money, we'll spend it. So we made this contact with the workhouse. I don't know how that started, but that was Manfred Mann's studio. And he needed more funding, so we had this money. So, oh, well, let's invest in a studio. And, and that was where we put in Ian. Such a brilliant record. From November 1978, a number one hit for Ian Dury and the Blockheads. And that was the biggest hit that occurred on Peter Jenner's watch there. Uh, up to that point, who knows, though, what will come in the years, in in the next few years, maybe more number one hits, too. Uh, the B-side of that, by the way, was there ain't half been some clever bastards. And uh, we're going to catch up with Peter, hopefully, on the 12th of January. Uh, we've got that penciled in, and if he's free, he'll come in and we'll uh, catch up with his further ongoing career with people like uh, Robin Hitchcock and Eddie Reader, The Clash, uh, Billy Bragg, of course, and uh, what he's doing at the moment. So there's lots of uh, exciting stuff still to come.
I'm Tom Robinson. This is Six Music. Huge thanks to Peter Jenner. Our regional BBC introducing tips next, coming from Jess Izzat and Andy Backhouse, the production team behind BBC Introducing in London, coming up next. BBC Radio Six Music. This Christmas on Six Music. Hello, I'm Zari Ashton. Hello, this is Diane Morgan. Hey, this is Courtney Barnett. Enjoy the company of three wise women. Come on. We take control of the six music studios, each curating a night of our favourite programmes. To be honest, I've never been a huge fan of Christmas. You feel slightly nauseous at the end of it. What do you mean that sounds ridiculous? Delving deep into the BBC archives to find shows, documentaries and live sets that we want to share with you. It's extremely out there. I think live music is so powerful. I love how it brings people together all over the world. This is Three Wise Women. It's going to be really good. Starts this Christmas Eve. From four with Zowie Ashton. Hey Tom, Jess and Andy here from BBC Music Introducing in London. Hope you're enjoying the festive season, Tom. We've got some Christmassy rap treats for you from the London show. Me and Jess, we work behind the scenes sifting through all the music and we've heard a lot of good stuff recently. Yes, we've actually got three tracks for you, which has been so hard to whittle down. So this has been a very hard decision. First up, we've got the latest from Arlo Parks. Now, I say the latest because she actually first uploaded her music back in October 2017. So just over a year ago now, we have been getting very well acquainted with her. But she has now decided to officially release her debut track. This one is from 18-year-old Arlo Parks. It's called Cola. It is deep, it is meaningful. Listen to those words. She's very poetically inspired. This is Cola from Arlo Parks. I know I don't really care Cos you're running around over there I'll miss your T-shirt in the rain The one that makes you look like Jared Wayne Eating grapes in the back of the party Throwing hands cos she drank your Bacardi I know it's kinda dumb, but I miss the way you dressed all punk With the black and the studs and the ripped up gloves that she loved your tough So I know that she has got some brand new music coming up very early in the new year. That's Arlo Parks with her debut track, Cola. If you like that one, very sort of melancholy, soulful vibes, and it is her debut offering. Definitely make sure to check that one out in full. It's Jess and Andy here from behind the scenes on the Introducing a London show. And this track is hot off the press. It's by a band called Ugly. They're from London. They're the first signees to sports teams home front label. They've got a great EP out called Sunday School. And if you want to see what they do live, they're playing at the 22nd of January in the new year at the Old Blue Last in London. But right now, check this out. Great band. This is the last supper of the Regal Weatherspoons. Now for treasonous reasons, deceivings, I'm leaving I love you, my children, you heathens I can't do this no more I patiently waited, said Judas the poor He's no king, he's a poor Now I've seen this twisted, yeah, I've seen it all He's a feverish cold Spreading his jokes to the feeble and all There's the dead of the cold Jesus is waiting, your food's getting cold that band are called Ugly, and the track is called The Last Supper of the Regal Weatherspoons, taken from their Sunday School EP out on sports teams' label Homefront. And it's got, I like that, Jess, it's got sort of a King Crawl, early, the full vibe of you of that disposition. Good yeah, band, right? Absolutely wicked tip, Andy. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to be checking out more of their stuff, and I did not know that they were on sports teams' label as well, so... Obviously, all round good decisions. So our final tip for today, and I guess our, our biggest tip so yeah. far, has to come from Mella. So he came in for an interview earlier this year, actually, so we thought it right to get him involved. He's been at Beat Herder Festival, also performed for us at the Lexington very recently. It was such a great show, wasn't it? It was quite an immense live show and you really feel quite connected to him and his songs in the set, I guess. It's like watching this raw nerve of emotion on stage. It's amazing. And it's been compared a lot to Arcade Fire early on in their careers in, you know, playing in tiny rooms. But it feels like Mello will be occupying bigger spaces next year in 2019.
And when he was a featured artist, he did say that he wanted, with his lyrics, to make people think and question what they do with life. So the main hook of this track, yes, it is what it is, but what it is isn't right. Kind of opposing the norm, you know, making us think that not everything that has been is the way it should be. So I was very excited to see how you translate that on stage. And it was really good, really impressed us. And it's a great fit on Radio 1. You might have heard it, this track as well, because it's been on heavy rotation as the introducing track of the week between Ariana Grande and Mumford. And more than anything, it's just a really catchy song, isn't it? So thank you very much for having us, Tom. This is our regional tip from Mella. This is What It Is on BBC Six Music. Well, you said it is what it is, but what it is isn't right. When you're falling into the feeling, losing the fight to feel bright. I'm tired of listening to the killers and the preachers at night. Oh, you said it is what it is, but what it is isn't right. You take it out on the weakest for a reason but spite. Preacher exaltation just because your skin's white. to fight Thanks to Andy and Jess for those three tips from BBC Introducing in London. Uh, first, we had a clip from Cola by Arlo Parks, and then Ugly's The Last Supper at the Regal Weatherspoon, which I think is terrific. It's from their EP Sunday School. What a great title. And then hot favourite at BBC London, Mella, a.k.a. Liam Ramsden from South East London, with What It Is. That's all over Radio 1 like a rash at the moment. And uh, thanks both. Have a great Christmas, Andy and Jess. And their show goes out every Saturday from 8pm on BBC London. Uh, right now, though, we're looking to Stuart McConey and the Freak Zone playlist happening in an hour's time. Uh, but between now and then, I've got my own BBC introducing mixtape, which uh, goes out tomorrow night, technically the small hours of Monday morning, which means it's actually on Christmas Eve. And uh, it's a real banger this week. It's got some fantastic tunes in there. And how, uh, how am I going to prove that? by playing 
well, best part of an hour's worth of highlights from it uh, in, uh, in between now and midnight. So, let's get ready for that as we enter... The After Hour. Thank you. 